Hello and welcome to The Gaggle, where we challenge and if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm Peter Lavelle. We're going to do another Verus update. We have Dmitry Babich. He is a writer and analyst at InnosMe um, Internet Media Project. And of course, we have George Samuli. He is a writer, a commentator, and a co-founder of this channel here. Dima, let me go to you first here. Okay, we we had a presidential election that some people call contested. Um, we see that coming, those kind of words coming from the West, not e exactly in that way, but it's moving in that direction, which is, of course, a code for what could possibly happen. Uh, we've had um, Lukashenko, uh, uh, President Lukashenko kind of equivocate about maybe something could change. Um, and the Russians have made it very clear that they don't want to get involved in uh, Belarusian politics and they don't want anyone else to get involved in it. And I'd like to put uh, stress that from what I have seen and from what I have been told, po protests have been largely peaceful. In this, in, the, in this case, those words mean something, not like in the U.S. Go ahead, Dima. Well, I think the situation is very dangerous uh, because uh, the only option, the only alternative to Lukashenko, uh, as it becomes clear now, is basically the coming to power of Belarusian nationalists. Uh, that's a sad reality, which is very dangerous for Russia, uh, because the story with Ukraine repeats itself, then Russia will be in a very bad strategic situation. I think it will be worse for the whole world, because if NATO moves uh, to the distance of about 500 kilometers from Moscow, that will create unstable situation. And uh, just recently it became clear that uh, the real program of Belarusian opposition, uh, it was hidden before the, right before the election, but textual coincidences with the program of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, you know, the main candidate of the opposition, they, they show that uh, this was the real program of uh, Belarusian opposition. It was published on a site called Za Belarus, uh, and it says that uh, if the opposition wins, Belarus should leave the Union state with Russia. It should leave the collective, uh, uh, collective security treaty organization. And it should leave uh, the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, application for membership in the European Union and NATO should be made uh, as possible. Yep, so yep. when... But Dima, if I can interrupt you here, this sounds like this manifesto was written in a think tank in an, a highly air-conditioned office in Washington, D.C. Let me go to George here. Uh, George, I mean, with Belarus's economy so intertwined and connected and bound to Russia's, I mean, everything that Dima just said about this manifesto of the opposition is clearly not in the at least the economic interest of Belarus, okay? I mean, you know, you sh I believe in sovereignty and I believe in the people's will and, I and if you're going to have elections, they should be clean. I, I have no problem with any of that. But this program is not in Bear, uh, Russia's uh, economic, financial, even um, strategic interest. George? No, that's absolutely right. Um, uh, should uh, this program be implemented, then uh, Belarus's uh, relative prosperity would be wiped out overnight. Uh, because uh, all those industries uh, that have been uh, serving the Russian market uh, will essentially be wiped out. I mean, they would be bought up for a song by uh, the Western multinationals, and you know, most of the workers will simply be laid off, and they'll be producing some you know, rubbishy stuff uh, for European markets. So suddenly, Belarus, which had enjoyed considerable prosperity uh, relative to Ukraine, would cease to do so. Uh, so those workers who went on strike and, you know, those, uh, um, you know, journalists or whatever who were initially supporting the opposition to um, Lukashenko really should think very carefully about where they're going because, you know, if, if, if they get their wish, they might suddenly find themselves without any work. Yeah, I mean, and, and to both of you here, I mean, look what happened to Ukraine. Um, uh, Russia created uh, import substitution for things that it, it used to be made in Ukraine that they would buy. Um, no one wants to buy the Ukrainian um, industrial output. It's, and the European Union certainly isn't going to lead, uh, allow Ukraine to be uh, a major agricultural 
uh, uh, country w uh, within the EU, because that is something that the EU has uh, uh, never ever really completely figured out. So, I mean, again, I, I have to wonder where this manifesto comes from, because it's not in the economic, certainly not in the economic interests of the uh, average Bayo Russian. And we have to point out to our viewers that it is still a largely state-run economy, okay? This is one of the anomalies of Belarus. They basically maintain the economic model that was it's a fair resemblance to the Soviet Union, its economic model. Uh, Dima, what, where is Lukashenko fit in all of this right now? Well, to be frank with you, I think not too much attention should be paid to his person. Uh, I don't care about his personal fate. Uh, I agree. Uh, there was one... <laughs> Uh, you know, unfortunately, that's the, the tactic of the web. They uh, concentrate all the attention on just uh, one particular person, usually uh, a distasteful person in some country that they want to destabilize. And uh, an average viewer or an average reader gets an impression that all the problems are just connected to one person. So if we remove him, uh, life will be so much better. That's always uh, an appeal to emotions. You know, the Western media never thinks two or three steps ahead. It's just bad Lukashenko should leave, you know, or bad Gaddafi should leave. And then we have a civil war in Libya and we have a civil war in Iraq uh, as if it could not be predicted, you know. So uh, Lukashenko had one achievement. Uh, basically, in the 90s, when he came to power, uh, Belarus had a much worse economic situation than Ukraine, because Ukraine at least has coal and steel. Belarus has nothing in terms of natural resources. It's just uh, an important transit country between Russia and the European Union. So Lukashenko managed to uh, gain the maximum from this situation. He uh, uh, kind of preserved uh, the industries, uh, the old Soviet industries, which suddenly, when reformed, started giving jobs and started, uh, uh, you know, providing for the country, something that uh, very few people expected in, uh, in the 90s. Uh, so that was an achievement. But he has been in power for 26 years, and that's definitely too long. Dima, you, you, talked, you talked about um, uh, this manifesto that it is basically uh, a nationalist manifesto. What is Belarusian nationalism? I mean, I, 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 I'm not really familiar with what that is. Okay, go ahead. Well, the story is very simple. Uh, basically, there is very little ethnic difference between Belarusians and Russians, just like there is almost no uh, ethnic difference between Ukrainians and Russians. You know, I, I could not tell you if a person I'm talking to is Belarusian or Ukrainian, you know. Uh, they usually speak Russian uh, without an act, you know, with uh, very, very rare exceptions, right? So there is no such problem as misunderstanding between ethnic groups. But of course, you want to exploit uh, divisions. If you widen the divisions, then you can uh, basically alienate any group inside a population, right? We, we see it how... Uh, the ultra-liberal ideology achieving it in, in the United States now, in, in before that in other countries. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the real problem is uh, if indeed uh, Belarus uh, goes the Western way and the nationalist opposition wins, then it won't be stability, you know, uh, because a huge part of the Russian population would not accept it. Let me go to Georgia. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with the history and the economy and the people of Belarus. Um, being anti-Russian isn't something that really comes to, to my mind here. I mean, obviously, there are going to be people that will be taking cues for the West in their interest of power, okay, and to be a co-opted group. We've seen this all through the post-Soviet space. But, I mean, I, I just don't see that's a winning ticket, okay, because I don't find it would have legitimacy. I can see economic grievances and the lack of productivity, um, the lack of... of uh, expectations of prosperity all of those things work to me uh but blaming moscow i and ethnic russians i mean in fact they are go ahead george yes i mean it's a case a case of what we found um 
after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, we also found the same in uh, Yugoslavia around that same time, which is that the West seizes on what the Bolsheviks did, uh, which is to uh, pretend that all these different nationalities are indeed really existing, because the Bolsheviks created so much of this nationalism. Like Belarusian nationalism was created by the Bolsheviks. Ukrainian nationalism was created by the Bolsheviks. Uh, same thing in uh, Yugoslavia. Tito created all these nations. In the case of Yugoslavia, it was in order to uh, keep the Serbs down. In the case of the Soviet Union, it was to keep the Russians down. And the West, of course, immediately seized on this and, and in fact, cultivated Belarusian nationalism. I mean, George Soros put a lot of money into Belarus, cultivating the Belarusian language. So, you know, what, what we have now is, is precisely that, that you know, the, the West is eager to push this line that there is such a thing as Belarusian nationalism, uh, much as they did, uh, you know, in the case of uh, Ukraine, that you, there's this Ukrainian nationalism. But of course, it, it's largely fictional. Well, I mean, uh, I, 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 would, I would push back a little bit on that. In, in Ukraine, there was a virulent, you know, um, um, uh, fascistic um, uh, interpretation of of you know, the Ukrainian identity, though, and that is really one of the biggest problems that Ukraine has right now. Because that basically, that came about through, uh, that after from Poland after Stalin incorporated, you know, Poland into Ukraine, and so that's that's where that this kind of virulent nationalism arrived from. Okay, Dima, we're going to wrap it up here. I mean, what is next? What should we be looking out for in Belarus? Well, I think the, the best solution for everyone would be for Lukashenko to get wiser and uh, sign uh, all the necessary agreements with Russia that he promised to sign and that he never signed since 1999 when the Union State was created. That would stabilize the economy and that would calm down the passions. And then step down because uh, obviously his days are numbered and his popularity is pretty low in Belarus. But he can't ju just leave now. If he leaves now, uh, then the only alternative, as I told you, is Belarusian nationalism. And I agree with George in principle that uh, these nationalists are artificial, but in Belarus they are even more artificial than in Ukraine because 95% of the population in Belarus speaks Russian in their daily conversations. and. Um, uh, there is no such thing as regionalism in uh, Belarus, unlike in, in Ukraine, because in Ukraine, different regions of the country belong to different countries. They, before 1939, part of the country belonged to Romania, part of it belonged to Poland, part of it belonged to Russia or Soviet Union. So in, in Ukraine, you have regional, uh, regional differences, and uh, that was one of the reasons for the civil war there. In Belarus, there are no preconditions for a civil war. But of course, any kind of difference, any kind of discontent can be exploited. Or, or so, in, uh, invented, invented. Okay. Exactly, exactly. So the, the best solution for everyone, including the West, would be for Mr. Lukashenko to prepare his own exit. Uh, but uh, basically, I would say that we were very lucky that uh, Lukashenko, because of his treacherous attitudes, you know, he created uh, this fiction about Russia uh, possibly going to invade Belarus. That was his fiction, which, which the West believed. So the West did not prepare the resources for so, supporting the protests so saying, when they started. You're saying, you're saying to me that the West is going to believe a man that they have called for at least a decade, if not longer, the last dictator in Europe. George, 30 seconds, wrap it up. Yes, no, that, uh, that's exactly right. Um, but the West is playing a very dangerous game here um, because they are clearly uh, siding with the opposition. They are interfering in uh, Belarus's uh, internal affairs, knowing that uh, Russia will never accept a hostile nationalist uh, state that is a de facto ally of NATO's. And for the EU to uh, intervene and, and egg, egg on the Belarusian protesters is height of recklessness. Okay, gentlemen, that's all the time we have here. I want to thank Dima and I want to thank George for joining the, the gaggle. And I wish all viewers to like, share and subscribe. We'll be back soon.